Welcome to episode 41 of the Rex Chapman Show with my super dope homeboy from the L-Town, Josh Hopkins. What's up, buddy? How are you? What's up, Rex Everett Chapman? Where are you right now? I'm in Dallas, the big D, uh, getting ready to head over and watch the Phoenix Suns and Dallas Mavericks play. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Guess where I am. Guess where I am. Where are you? I got a, I got a hint for you. Uh, iPod, EarPod place. You're at the EarPod no, place. No, uh, uh, Biceps. Watch. You're Watchville. You're at. No, oh. no. I'm Rexington. at the store knob. <laughs> I'm surprised you figured that me. out. I'm in You're Lexington. in Lexington, Lex yes, Vegas. At my mom's house. I'm in my mom's guest bedroom taping this. That's that's your room. Everyone knows. Ooh, Nobody cares. No. I like there's it. My, there's my trophies over there. <laughs> um, Ribbons. Uh, how you been, buddy? I'm good, man. Just uh, let me just ask you real it. quickly. We yep. should do a do a uh, book club real quick. Have you read these yeah. things? Wait. Nothing. Not a thing. Yeah, me. Either. That's been book club. Yeah. Uh, episode so, 41 episode oh, yeah. 41 any uh notable 41s you can think of i can think of what? one here Back in Kentucky. big d here in the big d dirk Who's nowitzki that? number oh, 41 yeah, dirky yeah. what about mark pope mark Back pope kentucky. university mm-hmm. of kentucky how about wes unseld oh i think he's all right i think he's probably uh-huh. pretty good trey lyle's at kentucky Trey Lyles at Kentucky. Um, Tom Seaver. Tom, Tom Seaver, Seaver. Really? really? Yeah. 41. Um, you know, Glenn we got to talk. A, That's uh, a shooter we, we, we haven't had on. We've had on all the great shooters. I know. I Glenn know. Wright's on. 41. Uh, we've got a really good guest later today that I'm uh, here. We'll get to in a second. Uh, but I'm excited about today's guest. Before we talk about today's guest, though, um, Tyler Hero. Our homeboy, yes. uh, University of Kentucky. Before the season started, he took some heat because uh, he said he felt like he was in the same conversation with ja, uh, with Ja and uh, or with sorry with Trey Young and Luca, and yep. he took everybody a lot laughed. Of, he took a lot of shit, and everybody laughed. And look at him now, six man of the year. I think he averaged like twenty points a game. Um, He's dirty, filthy, and we he both is. got to see it. We got to see him before he became just filthy, filthy, but it's especially gratifying, right? Yeah, it's just, it's just so much fun. You know what I love about his game? Because you just – people think shooter, but, I mean, he's so much more, and he's a great passer. He rebounds. He he uh such a good facilitator. He knows the game. He just yeah. does. He knows he's a good basketball player. He doesn't just have one extreme talent that makes him, you know, unique. He can do it all. I, I love his game. Takes me back to my favorite Tyler Hero story. Um, I'm over there. They're get they're in college. He and uh, what's our guy that plays for the Spurs, Keldon Johnson. They're freshmen. Mm-hmm. They're getting ready to take a trip to the Bahamas. And Cal asked if anybody on the team couldn't swim. And the only guy on the team that raised his hand was Tyler Hero. Tyler couldn't swim. And I remember everybody laughing at him and all that. Me asking him after practice. Grew up in Wisconsin, lakes, land of lakes and all right, that. Right, right. And um, I said, you can't swim? How do you not? He said, I was just hooping, man. Like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Didn't, yeah. didn't learn didn't how have to have time swim. for oh, it. Didn't have time for learning how to swim. He was just There hooping. was a. There was a video or uh, a story, but I thought it was just caught on tape in the locker room or something in Miami with Jimmy Butler. And he said, oh, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I said, I, I, I can't swim. And Jimmy Butler goes, you got some hood tendencies. <laughs> hilarious. Hilarious. Uh, yeah. So I'm happy for Tyler. And then the other the the big news in the playoffs, uh, I don't know if it's so big. They're the two seed in the West. The Memphis Grizzlies are in a in a dogfight right now with the Golden State Warriors, and something happened in Game One where Draymond took a hard foul and got a flagrant two and was mm-hmm. tossed out of the game, and he should have been, I thought. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the next night, though, Dylan Brooks comes back and he takes out uh, Gary Payton Jr. Mm. in a really egregious way. And uh, I think Steve Kerr after the game said he broke the code, which is friend of the know, show. Friend of the show. We can, and as athletes and basketball, any athlete, you're out there and you're playing within the confines of the rule. At any time, you can hurt somebody. At any mm. moment, if you somebody goes up for a shot, you can run right under them and take them out if you want. That's not allowed because there's this unwritten code that you don't do that to people in the sport. Mm. You're not trying mm -hmm. to hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. And Dylan Brooks' uh, foul was awful. It mm -hmm. was awful. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. suspended. He's suspended for it. I, I'm sick for Gary Payton Jr. He's fought and fought and fought, fought his way into a starting role and a starting role on this team. And that's where I'm going with this. Yes, I do think he uh, Dylan Brooks broke the code. Um, and I like Dylan Brooks a lot as a basketball player. It's got nothing to do with any of that. Um, but further what it does, it really hurts gold. Dylan Brooks will be back playing, you know, in two games they might not be around. The, the series will still be going on because it's one, one Gary mm -hmm. Payton jr. Is not coming back for the warriors. Mm -hmm. And that is a big loss for them. Not only mm -hmm. in this series, but should they advance and play mm -hmm. in the next series, it changes them. Now, you yeah. know, Draymond's got to guard more people. He's got to be that guy. You know, think about in the next round, it, whether you play Dallas or Phoenix, Gary Payton would be guarding Luca. Gary Payton mm -hmm. would be mm -hmm. guarding Devin Booker, would be guarding Chris Paul. Mm -hmm. That's a big, that's a big deal. And from that oh, standpoint, yeah. I'm just devastated for the Warriors. Yeah, that was, um, from an early age, you learn, don't go up under someone don't right you know you know you know you see it in the 80s you see it's been, mm -hmm. the code was written in and people did it right you know they they took people out that way before the game was you know changed a little the way it is but that's always been you don't especially especially those guys that go that high yeah like yeah gary payton jr uh, i mean he he's sick athlete when he gets up in the air mm -hmm. yeah um it's a brutal part of the game. It's uh, you don't, you hate to see it, and you you hate to see because people sometimes you people go up under someone and it's it's fighting, you know. But yeah, they didn't get hurt. They don't break anything. And to see a guy out, yeah, it's, and it's and it's, it it sucks. And we're still talking about it. We're not talking about the one that Draymond committed because the guy didn't get hurt. <laughs> Brandon Clark didn't get hurt, and that's but he hit him the, and whatnot, but he, he didn't him. go up under him. You know, right. that's you're the, right. That's it's a rule. different, it's a different that's rule. It's a different case. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, Josh. Let's get to our guests. You want to do that? How about that? How about that derby though? This last Kentucky Saturday, derby. Huh? Yeah, that was great, huh? What a horse! This Unbelievable, and can eat. Yeah, oh, and eats like a horse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was a great derby. That's one that will go yeah, down, and it was. It'll go down derbies. in history. Yeah, it yeah, really as, will. as that it derby, will. as that derby. What a horse! Uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah. Who we got? Who we got? You know what? We've got one of my one of our SEC brothers, SEC Player of the Year in 1988. He was a NBA 13 year. NBA center and four-time NBA champ with the Bulls and with the Spurs, Chicago Bulls pre and post game host William Edward Purdue the third. How's it going, Will? <laughs> All right, if you're going to go there, I'm just going to start off and go sexy Rexy. I'm doing really well, my friend. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Good buddy, and you're in Chicago. Uh, you're in Chicago today, I guess. Yes, sir. It's uh, in Chicago. We're we're patiently waiting for spring to arrive. We've, we're getting a lot of April showers in May. So the flowers look great, but the weather is, <laughs> is not allowing them to bloom. Or should I say the blooms don't last very long. So I think we're going straight from winter to, to summer because next week we're going to – today's a high of 48, and next week we'll be in the 80s. Oh, wow. Fantastic. So, but, but I'm happy to hear – 
that you, sir, are in Dallas. Yeah, so, I saw uh, that. So, yeah. oh, maybe are, are you actually going with Jimmy? Uh, Jimmy, uh, no, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> uh, I've had to tell everybody when we watch those games, everybody's like, who's that guy? <laughs> Who is that guy? That's and Jimmy. I'm like, all right, all right here's yeah. the story. <laughs> this is who Jimmy is. So those He's of you that are forever. watching, what is – I have to – I apologize. Jimmy Walker. What is, Jimmy, Jimmy Walker. Walker. Yep. Grew up in Milwaukee and watched Kareem Abdul-Jabbar play for the Bucks before he went to the uh, Lakers. That's yep. how old he is, and that's how long he's been a basketball nut. And and he so, would right. be at the Suns games, and uh, everybody from Muhammad Ali on down, you'd see sitting next to Jimmy Walker at the Suns games for for decades. Uh, what a guy! Uh, Will, I got a, something I don't know. Um, you're from 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 Florida, a mm-hmm. football and baseball state. Uh, did you ever think about playing anything else? Were you always tall? And where does that come from? Your parent, I'm parents, I, I assume, but uh, who's tall in your family? So I'll try to go down the list. First of all, all right. on my mother's side, my mom grew up on a farm in Lynchburg, Virginia, and my mom was uh, 6'1". She has a brother wow. that is about 6'4", and my grandfather was about six, six. And supposedly my great grandfather was seven feet. So I had significant height on my mother's side. Um, I like most kids in Florida Rex, I started out playing football and baseball, right? Because basketball, quite honestly, was the sport in Florida that, that all athletes played to stay in shape for their sport. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I kid you not, my elementary school, which back in Maryland, Florida, was first through sixth grade. We did not have an indoor gymnasium. Didn't exist. <laughs> wow. The only basketball courts we had were outside, on the pavement, double rims, <laughs> chain <Fun>. link nets. <laughs> And basically, everybody used them to do pull-ups. Yeah. Hardly anybody played basketball. That was just – it wasn't something you did. So, like most kids, and in, and for me, in elementary school, the big thing that you were dreaming about growing up was playing in the turkey bowl. And the turkey bowl was sixth graders against fifth graders in flag <laughs> football. <laughs> okay. Mm. I did on I Thanksgiving. Mean, even, yeah, uh, it was that Wednesday before you got out for Thanksgiving <laughs> yeah, every right, year. So right. the turkey bowl. Yeah. So the school got out early and the parents would come. And I mean, that was the thing. You think about this. An elementary school had no indoor gymnasium, yeah, paved basketball courts, but yet we had a football field. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> It just you yeah. gotta have your priorities, yeah. right? And then I behind guess. the ba- behind elementary school was little league baseball field that was really nice. And <laughs> you either and that's how you grew up. So I played football until I was in seventh grade. And then I realized that as skinny as I was, and, and just to kind of yeah. give people an idea, when I graduated high school in nineteen eighty-three. I was 6'10", 195 pounds. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. So wow. I, I used to joke that I could stand behind a stop sign and turn sideways and you wouldn't <laughs> be able to see me because the stop sign would block my head and then the, the pole would block my body because that's how skinny I was. But, and then so I stopped playing football in seventh grade. What were you playing thought, in, in grade school? What position did you play in football? I played uh, tight end and defensive end. <laughs> okay. So you go across the middle a few times, and back then, you know, <laughs> kids didn't have the best arms. So needless to say, the passes were not very accurate. So a lot of times you were extending and exposing <laughs> yourself. And you, oh you take God. a couple hits over the middle, 
and you just lay there on the ground and you're just uh, like, yeah, I don't think this is for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I really, but I always had a little payback when I played defensive end because of my size, I was pretty quick. And because of my length, like if I was getting blocked, I could usually r- reach around the blocker, the, the tackle and grab the quarterback, you know, cause back then you didn't have those tearaway jerseys. So you could right. grab the quarterback yeah. by the Jersey and kind of, and that's also when everybody back then, there wasn't the little pads. Everybody had those huge Dude. shoulder pads, yeah. regardless <laughs> yeah. of what position you played. And I could get a hold of those. or And plus, also, uh, horse collars didn't exist mm-hmm. back then. You yeah, grab them, yeah. throw them down. <laughs> so that's kind of where I had payback. But it was just – it wasn't for me. But I became so – for th- about a three- or four-year period, I became so in, enthralled with baseball that – when I played in Babe Ruth, so when I was 13, 14, and 15 years old playing Babe Ruth baseball, I played with a wooden bat. I refused to play with aluminum because I, everybody would ask me why I would play with a wooden bat. And I said, well, when I, get from, when I get to go to college from Major League Baseball, I don't have to make the transition. I'll already have <laughs> the expertise with the bat. So I literally <laughs> was a kid – and I didn't have my I didn't have my serious growth spurt until high school. So wow. 13, 14, 15, I was still average, you know, I was taller than everybody else, mm-hmm. but it wasn't like by, you know, a foot, six okay. inches. It was like maybe an inch. Okay. So, but still skinny. But everybody else is using aluminum bats, ripping balls off the fence, hitting home runs. I'm laying down bunts. I'm hitting doubles in between the gap. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working on stealing. I'm working on all the, you know, the fundamental aspects of the game. I'm not a power guy. And just, I hit that growth spurt in high school. And that's when I decided, well, you know, I think I better give up baseball and really focus on basketball. So I didn't, I didn't start playing basketball seriously till I was 13. Well, that's, that's what I wanted to ask. Um, Cause I, I, I knew of you when I got to college, like, or yeah, when I got to college, you'd already been in college for, for two years. So, so what was say, a, who were you recruited by and sort of when did you spring on to people's radar? Because you had to have gone pretty unnoticed for a while in high school. Yeah. So yeah, I could, because also you think about this now, the high school I go to, is also now in high school at the time in Florida was just 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. So you had, mm-hmm. you had, uh, jun- you had elementary school, no organized basketball. Wow. Get, get to seventh grade at 13. I finally decided to try out for the seventh. There was this seventh and eighth grade team and the ninth grade team. I try out in seventh grade, don't make the team. Try out again in eighth grade, I make the team, but I hardly play. Ninth grade only team. I make the team all year. The whole season, I score one point, one wow. point total. So you think about this. Now I'm starting to kind of start to grow a little bit. I'm the skinny kid that's playing basketball. And because I'm so bony, I literally was wearing elbow pads, knee pads. <laughs> yeah. But I had I, – I remember this, and you'll remember this, Rex, because I guarantee you, you, you wore these shoes. <laughs> I, at that time, was one of the only guys that was wearing, to this day, I think might be the best basketball shoe ever made, the Adidas Top 10. Top 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, yep. I, I had to order them, and it took – because of the size, at that time I was already wearing a size 15 in ninth grade. <laughs> I had to order them, and it took about – eight weeks to get them. And literally I was the kid that was riding my bike up to the, to the uh, sporting goods store and run in. Is my shoes here? No, yeah. don't worry. We'll call you. When they come in, we'll call you. And I'd walk out dejected, but I just, I started playing in high school and I didn't really pop up on anybody's radar until after my junior year. Cause even then now I get to high school as a sophomore Remember how little I played in ninth grade? Yeah, yeah. So in between ninth and tenth grade, I get aggressive. I'm like, okay, I'm going to as many basketball camps as I can go to. I go to the high school basketball camps. I go to the Stetson 
Back to the day, the Stetson Hatters had the best basketball camp yeah, in Florida. Yeah, they did. They sure did. And uh, Coach Wilkes ran a really good camp, and I went there, and I liked it so much I went back again the same year. Learned a lot. So I explode onto the scene, at least in the state of Florida, my junior year. And this is also now at a high school, Merritt Island High School, that at the time – was averaging 10 to 12 guys a year going D1 in football. Wow. Mm. Wow. Every position known to man, defensive end, wide receiver, tight ends. I mean, my junior year, Jeff Wickersham, the parade All-American USA Today quarterback of the year, goes to LSU. Got guys going to Notre Dame. We got guys going to Florida, Miami. I mean, all the power five schools, Michigan, you know, and then – that our basketball team literally had eight guys until football was over. <laughs> yeah. And then football right. would always go in deep into the playoffs. So, you know, the season starts, we got eight guys and we got two guys that probably shouldn't even be on the team, but because we can't, we got to wait for football to be over. We got to put a squad together. So we put the team together. And then when football comes, you know, we start to gel towards the end of the year because we pick up five guys already that right. are great. Not necessarily basketball players, but great athletes. Great athletes. And how tall are you remember, at this point as a junior? Uh, I'm about – so I went from 6'1 in ninth grade to 6'10 as a senior. Wow. So I grew nine inches in four years. Did that so, hurt? Like did you, know, you have growing fortunate. pains and knee pains? I, I really never had growing pains, but I always tell people I was wearing capris before they were cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we didn't call them that back then. Yeah, yeah. But and then you know, you didn't experience this, I don't think, because of you know the, the whole. But I started out being recruited recruited by smaller schools, Furman and Stetson, and you know, and I thought that was the coolest thing. And then it is the coolest thing. That's what I mean because those are those are D one schools. I remember. I, oh, I yeah. think I got I got my first letter from like Illinois State, and you couldn't you couldn't tell me for two weeks I wasn't going to Illinois State. Like that's yeah. that was the big deal. So yeah, that's fascinating. These are already D one schools that are coming after you, though. Right, but the smaller D one schools that right, you know, and the coaches admitted they're like, hey, we're. We're not going to lie. We're looking at you as, as you as a project. We figure you, we can bring you in. We can red shirt you. And I'm, I'm, I'm all in. I'm like, yeah, no problem. But, you know, I was fortunate enough that I had a coach that Haskell Light was like, hey, just relax on the recruiting trail. Don't jump on anything yet. You're still maturing. Don't be in a hurry. So in between my junior and senior year, I go to the BC All-Star Camp in Milledgeville, in, Georgia. In Georgia. Yeah, I went there. Yep. Yep. And uh, I just remember my roommate, I mean, I couldn't even grow a shadow. No mustache, <laughs> no nothing. I mean, I'm as immature, feeble. You know, at this point, I'm about six, seven, you know, still skinny. But I just, I mean, I barely got a hair of my arms and my yeah. roommates this kid from georgia somewhere that grows a mustache who had a beard was shaving every day and i'm like i kept asking him how old are you again <laughs> we, were, we were the same age and i was wow. like man this is so i'm like I, I, that was that was my first experience where you know outside of playing high school f- basketball in florida where majority right. of the the teams are football players where I actually felt like I was playing with men that were basketball players, right? Not athletes that were playing basketball to stay in shape for another sport. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of when I took it to the next level. And that year I also, I went to BC camp, Stetson, Florida state, Florida. I mean, I was going wow. to a basketball camp for every other week for wow. the whole summer. And I also was very fortunate. I had a, a, a friend of mine that, moved to Florida because Merritt Island is where the Kennedy Space Center is. And his dad got a job at Kennedy Space Center, moved down there from Virginia, a guy by the name of Tony Longa, and he's the one that taught – he actually – think about this. Because, Rex, I don't know what it's like in 
in Kentucky, but in Florida, your basketball coach was also the chemistry teacher, the assistant oh, yeah. football coach. You know, they're trying to make all these stipends to help ends meet, right? Yep. But he had a pretty good history as a basketball coach, used to coach at another high school. So he was probably better than average when it came to high school. But I had a guy by the name of Tony Long, as I said, that basically was kind of teaching me um, – things about basketball that coach light wasn't that he had learned because he had been playing since he was like in fourth grade. Wow. Mm. And so I was very fortunate that he taught me how, and then we had this guy from Kentucky. I think he Rupert played it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> We've done our homework. Yep. He just, he again, same. Yep. I was about to say he played at Eastern Kentucky. So I got my ties back to Kentucky, man. There you go. Yes. Where he came, he came in, just this good old boy from, God, I forget the small town he was actually from. And he just came walking into practice one day and said, hey, coach, you mind if I help out? Because he just loved basketball, right? And that's – and he, again, another guy who would work with us in the summer and like Coach Light is assistant football coach, he would run practices and – you know, so you think about that. He had this older guy who was a former college player. He's not paying a dime to because he's an engineer out of the Kennedy Space Center. And in his own free time, it's helping these kids with basketball. Yeah. And that made a difference. I, I mean, such a difference in your whole life. I mean, it really does. Uh, yeah. I, I think about that. And I just – I always joked that, um, you know, he had two kids. And I became like a family member with them because he would invite me over wow. for dinner and hang out. And, and he was just a good old boy that loved basketball. Was, I mean, it was just. He just did know, it because he loved it. Yeah, period. Wow. And that's just kind of, you know, and then I ended up years later, uh, you know, living in Louisville for a long time. And it's just, I, I think, honestly, and you, I think you can second this. I think, unfortunately. Kentucky is misrepresented on the perception that people have, quite honestly. I agree. Mm -hmm. And I think because, unfortunately, on a whole, and I know this from experience because, mm -hmm. you know, my son's graduating from Trinity this year at 18 years old. The public school systems are so bad. I think the state mm -hmm. as a whole gets a rep, a bad rap, but yet they do a really nice job with – the private institutions, and I think they're really good. Now, unfortunately, yeah. I've been paying taxes for all these years and I had nothing to show for it because <laughs> I'm literally in the state of Kentucky have paid for my kid to go to school since kindergarten. Wow. Uh, but I think he's got a very good education. He's yeah. going to Miami University. He's, he's, he's getting a scholarship. So I feel like it's paid dividends, even though I've bitched and moaned for the last 18 years. Yeah. And How Josh? big is he? Um, he's 6'8". 215 pounds, plays lacrosse, and he's uh, plays wow. uh, deep hole. Terrific. You know, that's interesting because, you know, you talk about just the opposite states. You know, if you had been born and grew up in Kentucky, they'd had you in high tops in third grade. I mean, they'd yeah. have, you'd been doing footwork and left, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it, it, I think, would you say you fulfilled your potential probably – but you probably would have been burst onto the scene much younger and been more skilled earlier if you had grown up in Kentucky. I always wonder that, you know, and not even Kentucky, just a, a state like, like I said, my buddy that Tony Longer that moved down, he moved from Virginia where basketball mm -hmm. was a lot more prevalent. I always wonder that because it, it, I go back and I look at my career and to finish up your question, Rex, and then I'll circle back. No, all good. The schools I narrowed it down to were Georgia Tech, Virginia, Purdue, and Vanderbilt. But I also looked, you know, Florida was in state, Florida State, but they were football schools. I wasn't interested mm -hmm. in going to, you know, what was defined as a football school. And you'll remember the reason why I chose Vanderbilt, one of the many reasons why I chose Vanderbilt was obviously in education because my parents were just, it, obviously, if you look at the schools, I narrowed it down to. Yeah. But also the one of the five the, the two deciding factors were CM Newton, the head coach, mm -hmm. and the Jefferson Pilot Network. Because oh, yeah. Yeah. you got 
a Wednesday night game of the week yep. and a Thursday afternoon game of the week. That's and right. every school had to be on a certain amount of times. That's right. Now, you guys Jefferson at Kentucky Pilot. were all – yeah, you guys were always the CBS game of the, of the weekend on Sundays. So we never had that opportunity. But because that took you guys off the slate, Vanderbilt picked up a few more games. So that gave my parents an opportunity to see me play more. Plus, they could just drive up to Gainesville every, every year and see me play there. And one of the big selling points – by CM Newton was he's like, Hey, we just, we're a big family here. We have this big thing called the music city city invitational every year in between Christmas and new year's we host, we bring in all the families. Uh, we have a dinner the night before we have entertainment and, you know, CM Newton had a great connection with uh, the country music crowd. Mm -hmm. So we had Reba McIntyre one year. We had Ben <laughs> skill one year. You know, that was our entertainment for the, bank, the night before, right? So that's how I ended up at, at Vanderbilt. But to go back to your question about development, I looked at it in three phases. I always had to go back to square one, like when I learned how to play when I was 13, through my progression through high school. Because I, I like to brag like everybody else, you know, and I, my senior year in high school, I think I was like 32 and 12, 32 and 13. Wow. You know, great, great numbers. You know, I got uh, – didn't, but, you know, I wasn't the, uh, the uh, Florida State Player of the Year. Remember Frank Ford? Yeah, Played yeah. Auburn? Great he got player. Player of the great Year. I didn't player. get Player of the Year. So I know what Frank this feels it. like. I know what that feels like. <laughs> <laughs> so Frank goes to Auburn, I go to Vanderbilt. So, you know, but I never had animosity, but I just always, you know, would just, it was nice to be able to play against him. But I went through that first phase where I learned how to play and as the skinny kid that's undeveloped, not a lot of muscle, you know, but because of Rupert Stevens, because of Tony Long, because of Haskell, I was fundamentally sound. I could beat guys with my footwork, yep. you know, um, you know, using the backboard, doing a lot of things that guys didn't do, you know. Um, I get to Vanderbilt, get my ass handed to me, you know, basically back to square one, got to build yep. my body up. Um, don't really have a solid year until my junior year because, again, a Kentucky guy, Brett Burrow. Brett Burrow, pretty, and then didn't you – Brett Burrow and Frank Cornette too. And Frank was a great yeah, well, Frank was dude. behind me. He was a, also a little later. Uh, yeah, Jeff Turner. Jeff Turner, that's Nets, right. Lefty. Played on the Olympic right. team in eight, you know, yes. so in 84. So, you know, we had some decent big men. Obviously, Jeff was very good. Brett was pretty good as well. You know, he was yeah. I like to use the word crafty. Yeah. You know, he had the Kevin McHale up and under, always kind of kept you off balance. But yep. I learned a lot from these guys and then had a big North, junior North senior Harden year. High school. North Harden That's High right. School. Yeah. And that was, you know, the funny thing is, I think we, our team, every year, half our team was from the state of Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, yeah. we basically, the, the joke was, we took guys that couldn't get into get in Kentucky, <laughs> bring them to Vanderbilt, develop them. And then they were all SEC by their junior and senior year. Yeah. Yeah. And then beat Kentucky. So true. Them. Yeah. Like no occasionally, about occasionally Bill, would beat on. Kentucky. But oh. I mean, because you think about this, all these guys that you grew up watching play as you were going through high school with, you know, Phil Cox and yeah. then Burrow and guys you ended up playing against, Goheen, Wilcox, who you also probably played against in high yep. school. Yeah, you know, coming from Louisville and Scott Drought, you know, Scott Drought. Scott I mean, Drought. who's the little, who's the little white guy that could shoot that also was like won the state in tennis? That's Scott Drought. Oh, Scott, Scott Drought. Drought. Scott Drought. Scott Drought. 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 Scott yeah. Drought. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think Did, Phil Cox. Phil Cox is Hardin County, right? Uh, yeah, but but um, Scott Drought and Barry Goheen, they kind of motivated me. Like you know, you were talking about uh, you know, certain guys, uh, uh, Frank Ford, like. I kept hearing about Barry Goheen was a Barry was a year ahead of me. Right. But, and he was from Western Kentucky where I'm from. And I remember seeing him in a tournament and going, and I was like, Oh, you know, F this guy. 
And then I watched him play, and he was just so effective, so clever, so slippery. Wasn't a great athlete. And then he goes to Vandy. Then, but Droud averaged like thirty-five a game, and we're the same yeah. grade. But I never saw him play. <clears throat> we played on <clears throat> played on the Kentucky Indiana team together, and I fell in love with that guy. What a funny guy! Um, could really shoot, but you know he. He was. He wanted to go to Kentucky. And yep. ma- man, when we played you guys, you could you could mm. feel I could feel that, you know, it was a big game for them. And you guys beat us once and should have beat us twice. Uh, yep. the, but you think soccer. about it, but that's but that's an interesting point. And I'll ask you this question. You know, I dealt with this. So finish it up. I, I went through all those different phases and then I go to the NBA and it takes me a couple of years to get my sea mm-hmm. legs and develop into right. an NBA player. So I kind of had that same reoccurring dream at every level. Yeah. It took me a while to kind of, you know, the, the, you know, it took me a while to develop at every level, but I'll ask this question because, because I got to deal with this once I got into the NBA, excuse me, with the Chicago Bulls. And I would be, curious to how I would have dealt with this at a younger age because I've always felt like from a maturity standpoint not physically just emotionally and mentally I was also a late bloomer as well but yeah I mean how did you deal with going to Kentucky <laughs> and and you being the team that everybody measured themselves up against to and it wasn't just SEC team you guys yeah. played North Carolina you guys played Indiana you guys played Louisville I mean, yeah. Duke wasn't as, you know, Duke was just up and coming then. You know, they were starting to become Duke that everybody knows now. But I just remember, you know, that was, yeah. I mean, it's like in the NBA when the schedule came out, you know, the when, when are you playing the Bulls? When are you playing Michael right. Jordan? That's but right. in college, it was when are we playing Kentucky? We know we play him twice at home and on the road. But I mean, how difficult was that being at that young age? Because, yeah. I mean, you step on campus and you're already a marked man. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, good question. And I quite honestly, I think I had a, an advantage that my teammates didn't have having grown up in the state. <clears throat> I knew how big everybody's game was, it, you know, like I think Calipari gets in trouble for it saying, you know, it's everyone's Super Bowl playing against Kentucky and I, but I had teammates that didn't understand that at first, like other teammates. They knew it after a few games. They realized right. it. Um, because, and you, you're going to take everybody's best shot. But I think coming from Kentucky, I kind of I kind of knew, you know, what the deal was. I remember Eddie Sutton, I'll never forget, uh, my freshman year. And he'd only, he'd been there for one season. And they had a good year. They made it to the Elite Eight. And with Kenny Walker and yeah, yeah, I guess you played against those guys. And um, the next season though, he came in and he brought, this was the first day of practice. He brought out a box and opened up this box. It was a ring box and it had like, I don't know, eight, eight or nine of these uh, sort of the Southwest conference championship <laughs> rings. When he was and, in Arkansas. Yeah. Have we, did we lose Will's picture? Uh, I hope not. But yeah, he brought no. out Southwest. There we go. Uh, he brought out the Southwest Conference Championship rings. And I looked like I looked around. I'm a freshman and I look around to my teammates thinking that they're going to say something. And none of them said anything. And I'm thinking to myself, Nobody cares about conference titles at Kentucky. You can't, this can't be serious. So he really even didn't grasp, you know, kind of what the place was at, at that time. But yeah, it, 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 it sure, it certainly does give you, as I'm sure you went through in high school and, and as a young player, just like I did, you know, you learn how to play harder at each level you go to, you do, yep. you think you're playing as hard as you can in high school. I remember somebody showing me a tape, you know, years ago, and I'm just walking up the court and walking back and maybe getting back and maybe not, you don't know all that stuff. You know, you just sort of evolve, but going to a place like Kentucky, 
you do realize that it doesn't matter. You know, a lot of these guys are mad at you because you're at Kentucky and you oh, better, yeah. you know, you better risk. They wanted to be recruited and be where you are. And so I had I, that helped prepare me for the NBA, though, very much so, because, it, you know, that's the same thing. You know, especially if you're a high pick, you went through it. Guys are going to yeah. go at you. Right. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, it's kind of funny you mentioned that about work ethic and how to play harder. I was also very fortunate. So I step into the situation where I'm playing with the best player in the league and Michael Jordan. Yeah. And one of the things that I always kind of hung my hat on, you know, as I got into the NBA was my work ethic, you know, and I get to Chicago and I'm like, all right, you know, I'm just going to, I'll do what I do and, and be patient and I'll just outwork these guys. Well, that didn't exist because everybody now everybody. <laughs> at that level works that hard. Plus yep. I had the guy in Michael Jordan who not only was he the best player, but his work ethic was second to none. I mean, that's, yeah. that's probably what blew me away the most. And even then I had to sit down and be like, call back to my college coach. I had uh, Ed Martin, who's the assistant that kind of took me under his wing. And I was like, coach, you know, I need your help here. You know, you've developed me into this particular player. You've shown me and, and to help me define work ethic. But I got this guy up here that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, this guy is just – he's the opposite of everything you hear about when it came to NBA players. In the sense, and what I mean by that is, is, you know, a lot of people – and this isn't, you know, this is an outside perception mm -hmm. of people that aren't in the league. You know, because everybody wants to – and there was something on today while I was in the gym. You know, everybody wants to talk about Allen Iverson. And, you know, we're talking about practice, you know. Right. So that's kind of – people have that image of, you know, NBA players don't practice, don't work hard. They're just all naturally gifted players. And I just remember, like you talk about, your first day of practice at Kentucky. Mm -hmm. My first day of practice in Chicago. And – I just established NBA players, a veteran team. But yet here's this guy, Michael Jordan, that's just outworking everybody. And he's the best player. It's not like he's sitting on the sidelines. Yeah. You know, and I was just – I had to call Coach Martin and just be like, hey, I need you to come up here. You know, we need to talk. you got to help me figure out how I can get to the next level. You know, I need to expedite this process, this, this growth process, because right now I got this guy that just – he doesn't know anything about me. He's got a bad perception of who he thinks I am. Right. And I got to, how do I change that? And he, and he helped me do that. But, you know, Coach Martin did. He came up and watched game film with me. We sat in my living room. He came to practice because, you know, he was well-respected as the coach when he was the head coach at TSU. You know, he, he uh, was uh, Truck Robinson's uh, mm -hmm. college coach. So he had a lot of relationships with the NBA guys, so they let him come to practice, and he would watch practice, and take notes. and But that's where I was fortunate enough. I had somebody watching my back all the time. You know, I think there's a lot of guys in the NBA that <clears throat> didn't necessarily have that crutch that I had, but yet they had that inner toughness of being self-motivated. I, I was self-motivated, but it was yeah. just when I got to that level, I was just like I was kind of taken back. You were this what, particular guy. What did what did you think at first? Uh, Jordan's uh, perception was of you that you said you he had this perception. What was that? And do you remember a time when you saw his perception of you change? Nice. Well, he made a comment. You know, and I talk about this a lot too. He made a comment. He says, "Well, I can't refer to him as Will Purdue, but because he's not good enough to play in the Big Ten, so I'm just going to call him Will Vanderbilt." Oh, yeah, you know, I remember that. I remember that. And I just kind of – I shook it off, but – you know, Because I didn't play a lot. Oh, yeah, it hurt. I mean, that – Yeah. Because, you know, I always told people I had – I just didn't come in and have to impress the coaches. This was a different level of respect. I had to impress yeah. the coaches, but I also had to impress Michael Jordan because – you know, if you want to step on the floor, that guy's got to have the necessary respect for you to be out there and play with him. So, you know, I just kept plugging away, spent a lot of time in the weight room, came early, left late. You know, I tell people all the time, I mean, my rookie year, 
I think I played a total of like 183 minutes total yeah. over 82 games. So, you know, it's what, two, yeah. two minutes and 15 seconds a game. <laughs> I got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of um, two trillions, DNP CDs. DNPs, yeah. Yeah, but I was just, the one thing I didn't do, and that's the other thing where the game has changed a lot. I didn't, I didn't let that disappointment show externally. I mean, I had a lot of sleepless nights. My game of choice, and I, when I was younger, I, you know, we'd have a game. I wouldn't play. I'd come home. I would be frustrated, disappointed, you know, angry. I would sit there and play Tetris till three in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, just mindlessly, right? Yeah. Just, yeah. Just to, to escape for a this, little bit. Yeah. This anger. And then, then I would go to bed. you get that Tetris get... head. You get that yeah. Tetris that? head where you everything's Tetris when you play it yeah. too much. You're like, a car could fit in between those two cars. You're like, oh, oh yeah. yeah, too much too much Tetris. Well, it's either Tetris or I always joke it's one of the greatest Seinfeld episodes when uh, George has got to push the Frogger machine across the highway, <laughs> across the street. <laughs> it's, that's, a, that's a version of Tetris, right? Yeah. Right, right. But it was just, um, you know, and I did something, Rex, that I don't think a lot of players would have done. And it was actually recommended to me by B.J. Armstrong, who was a teammate Friend of mine. Friend of the show. Friend, Friend of, the, of show. the show. Yeah. B.J. and I became friends. And, and it, the reason the, how we became friends is, Rex, you'll remember, um, Olympic trials. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what we just said. Uh, BJ and I were talking about that. That was, yeah, just a week or two ago. Yep. Because remember, John Thompson was the coach. Yep, that's right. And um, I didn't make the, the initial cut, but I was asked to go on that European trip yep. um, with the, uh, like the, the second team. Right. And that's also where John Martin pulled me aside and he says – Normally, I would say go for it, but they're putting this team together to get David Robinson in shape, and he's going to play every single minute of every single game. You'll never play. That's right. Said so it's a free trip to Europe. Yeah. But my advice to you is to stay here. And that was for me. I was a senior. Get ready for the draft, and don't even worry about it. That's right? great advice. That is really. And great I was advice. just like, and now I was torn because. There was a part of me that thought play for okay, your country. I, yeah. Well, it wasn't even that. I was like, if I go on this trip, that'll that'll give me an opportunity to prove to Thompson and the rest of these guys that maybe I should be on the team. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that was that was hard to hear John Martin, who was at the trials, you know, because remember they bring up that first the first weekend they bring all these coaches in to help out yeah. and run drills. And you know, there's eight games going on at once and everybody's yeah. doing evaluations and it's kind of hard. You know, you had a, uh, what you think's a really solid senior year. You're now mentally, what? you're, you're thinking about preparing yourself for the next level. And I got a SEC coach. player of the year. Yeah. SEC player of the year. Very fortunate. I knew you were going to eventually mention that, <laughs> but I had a coach that was basically, and this was what I think what a lot of people are missing. He was honest with me. He said, don't go on that European trip because you'll never play and you're not going to make this team. And we took Alonzo Mourning on that team who was in high school, if you remember, and he was going to yep. play backup center. Yep. And yep. He, I'm glad you mentioned that because he told me that too. Because yep. I remember nobody would remember nobody would talk to Alonzo I Mourning. I remember. I remember. We're all sitting in the training room and we're all talking every, before practice getting taped and he would come in the training room and we'd all just shut up, not talk. <laughs> and he'd come in and sit down and look around and we'd all just be staring at him like, who's this punk, this, this he, high school kid? He was what in is high going? school. <laughs> I mean, he was a monster at that point already. Yeah. But also, he was just, you know, yeah, John Thompson, that's coach right. at Georgetown, brings him in, lets him work against college guys, get him ready for yeah. his freshman year. Right. You know, you're allowed that's to do right. that. That's within the rules. Yeah. But you think about, you know, I want to wear, wear USA across my chest. This is an opportunity. Right. Jeff Turner had motivated, and we played in 84. And here's my coach telling me, you're not going to make it. 
telling me to do two things that I'm dying to do. And he tells me, don't do it. Take my word for it. Just, you got to believe me. This is, but luckily I had developed that relationship with Ed Martin to where I believed him. Wow. And that's great. I just remember, and that, I mean, it's a long way of getting to BJ, but I just remember, you know, you got to, we had that last day of practice and then you literally had to get back to your dorm room, shower and pack in 15 minutes and take your luggage and go stand on the corner and wait for those bands to come. <laughs> That's right. To take you to the Denver, to uh, the uh, Colorado Springs, the Colorado, Colorado Springs, Springs airport. Yep. And I just remember sitting at the thing, just dejected. And BJ Armstrong was sitting next to me on a suitcase. I didn't know who BJ was. He was just one mm. of the hundreds of players that were there. Yep. You know, and we just kind of were sitting there chit chatting, shooting this shit, just talking. And, you know, he was going back to Iowa for his senior year. I was getting ready for the draft. And it was one of yep. those things we ride on the van together, blah, blah, blah. We get to Colorado Springs and you go your separate ways. And then, boom, a year later, he gets drafted by the Bulls. And now we're teammates and we become friends. But that's the great. whole point of the story was he pulled me aside and he's like, listen. He says, I know you're a better player than what you're getting an opportunity to show. Unfortunately, I'm on a veteran team with Bill Cartwright and Dave Corzine, <laughs> two established players. And I know a lot of people don't think that about Bill Cartwright, but what people don't realize is, is and I didn't know this until my rookie year when Bill and I are hanging out. I mean, he was so good. And Rex, you know what this meant. He was so good, yeah. He was on the cover of Sports Illustrated Why he was at San Francisco. Yeah. And kids these days are like, yeah, so. But, I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's how we got all our news. Every Thursday, Sports Illustrated yeah. came out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I totally forgot. I was like everybody else. I had a subscription. But I just remember, you know, my rookie year, I'm walking with Bill Cartwright. And as you know, you get in the NBA, there's aut autograph hounds everywhere. And all of a sudden, this guy just goes, hey, Bill, sign this. And I'm like, wait a minute. I grab it and I'm like, this is Sports Illustrated. <laughs> you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated? <laughs> you know? Just you're that yeah. young and, you know, immature and still. But you're playing with Bill Car Bill was a great player. You know? Oh, that's also a great like, player. Sports Illustrated was like if, if Instagram only had one highlight a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was it. You know? Like, that's all we No, had. you're exactly we right. That's, that's a great that's a great way to put it. Every yeah. Thursday, you get one Instagram or TikTok a week. Yep. And the most That's viewed it. TikTok or Instagram is the one you see. That's what yeah. Sports Illustrated was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I, it's just BJ pulled me aside. And he's like, listen, Corzine's now gone. He's like, why don't you hire somebody? And this is before agents did all the, yeah. you know, the – to bring the guys in and have mini camps and control workouts and all this stuff. He says, why don't you hire somebody to work with you? He says, Dave Corzine's living in Chicago. Why don't you hire Dave Corzine? And I was like, oh, okay. So I reach out to Dave Corzine. I asked Dave, can we work together this summer? And he says, absolutely. The first thing Dave came, did was he came in and spoke to Johnny Bach. Said Johnny Bach, I need every single tape of every minute that Will Purdue played last season. So you know, back then it's all those yeah, VCR tapes, a, right? Yeah. He comes in and Johnny Box gives him this box full of VCR tapes. So during that period where you know the season ends, you're taking three or four weeks off. Dave's just watching videos, videos of all the games that I did play. Take notes, right? So. This is kind of like the, the the poor man's version of of building your your own little AAU team. Yeah. <laughs> but Dave and I would work out. Uh, by at that point, now we had the Berto Center. We'd work out at the yeah. Berto Center five days a week, and then we would play games twice a week. Dave went and got a bunch of his buddies that played in college, and we played in these in these men's leagues. We would play on the north side, uh, which was off of Hollywood. We played in this gym that had about 12 courts in it, and we would play against all college players, ex-college players, a lot of uh, guys that played overseas, really good talent. Mm -hmm. 
And then to toughen me up, we'd play down in uh, Italian Village off Taylor Street and also in the South Side in these tournaments, in these weekend tournaments where literally there were fights in every game, right? Man, and, that's so great. And we would just sit down and watch film, and then we would go into each game with a with a almost like golf. You know, that's why I love golf so much is because you can go to the range and work on one specific thing. We would go mm-hmm. into each game working on a specific skill set. Mm-hmm. So it was it was kind of funny because the other team would get really frustrated. We would run almost a version of the North Carolina's four corner offense, but it wasn't a stall. It was I post up, get the ball into me, and go one on one. Work on my post moves. We had a game where that was, I mean, I think I had like 50 shots. And then when the other team realized what was going on, they start double teaming. And then we'd start <laughs> passing it around and hitting those guys in the corner. And he had a couple guys that were just dead eye shooters, right? But the whole point was, is for me to work on my post game. Yeah. And then the next game, it was okay, we're playing at this college gym. I'm going to, you're going to guard the quickest guy out of the perimeter. I'm like, what? Wow. Yeah. All you're going to work on is footwork. And we're not giving you any help. And if they isolate you, your job is to try to find a way to s- slow this guy down without fouling out, by the way, because we, yeah. we only had like six guys. Yeah. But that's how I spent my whole summer. Man. And I just, I remember I was telling people that they were, uh, people hear the story and I'm like, yeah, it's an NBA guy playing in all these leagues. And as you talk about now, you think about this, right? That's a lot of humility, man. It really is. We walk into the gym down off of Taylor Street. We walk in on the south side. And you think about, you know, we have this for the most part. I think nine of seven of the eight guys are white. Mm-hmm. Occasionally, Dave had a friend of his that would come play with us. And then we walk into these gyms where all the teams were playing. They're all black. Yeah. And then obviously they know who Dave is and then they know who I am. So all of a sudden, they're just like, it's fresh meat in here. Let's go. All right, yeah. boys. This is our chance. We've always dreamed of playing in the NBA. They got two NBA guys. Let's kick their ass. That's right. So it wasn't like you're just going to roll in and play a casual game. Because regardless of what, what we're talking about, I'm working on defense. I'm working on offense. Yeah. Those competitive juices kick in. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, you know, Dave wants to win. You know, I, I just remember we'd sit in the huddle, you know, we have no coach. Dave's the coach. And all these guys, and you know, we're just we're sitting during a timeout, and some teams, you know, one of these teams has got us down by ten early, and Dave is just like, "Listen, guys, I know we talked about going out and having beers after the game, but that's out the window, and I know we're going to be sore as hell tomorrow, but we're winning this game, and we <laughs> and that was one of those games where then you know you're pulling guys off of each other. There's skirmishes. Yeah. You know, even though the officials call it a foul, the other team's like, that's not a foul. And we'd be like, yeah, no foul. Check it up top. You don't want a foul, you take it. I mean, it was literally, right. you know, white man can't Big jump. Boy. Yeah. Out of Venice Beach, it's just like no blood, no foul. That's great. And then we would go sit on the street corner on Taylor Boulevard, and there was this little Italian ice stand in this, in this little shack. We'd walk up the street have Italian ice and just sit on, I mean, literally it was like the scene out of a movie. We're sitting on the, on the curb. One guy's got a black guy. Somebody's obviously <laughs> bleeding. Somebody's bruised. You know, we're holding ice with a hand cause there's no ice bandage. Yeah. You know, it's just, but that, that really changed who I was as a player and as a, as a person, how I changed my mentality, how I changed my approach. That showed you know, and too. Then, it, it showed Will when, you know, you'd gone from, you know, and I'm I, at this point I'm playing in Charlotte and I'm, we're, we have bad teams, uh, but I'm playing a ton of minutes. So it, but it was cool to see once you'd gone through that and gone through those first couple of years, it was really cool to see how once you had earned Michael's trust, how your confidence just seemed to grow where you became, you know, and then Purdue comes in and, you know, you've got to know what this guy does because he does it well. He's in his motor. He's going to rim run. He, if you throw it to him in the post, he's got this move. He's got that move. 
that had to be super gratifying to you, right? It was because again, it's kind of that whole progression of slowly developing in each level. But also the thing that was really beneficial to me was the triangle offense. Yes. Was right yes. up my alley. And that really benefited me as far as from an offensive production standpoint, but also the way that Johnny Bach had us playing screen roles and our defense, you know, I, I was able to do that as well, but you know, Rex, I got to, you, you mentioned Charlotte. Think about this. Kendall Gill, you know, I work with Kendall Gill here in Chicago. Yeah. What was your best team in Charlotte? Oh, man, I think we only won shoot, maybe 22, 21 or 22 games. Uh, it was the first – I was there three years. I think uh, – yeah, I, I want to say 21 games. But did you ever – because Kendall Gill talked about this. Did you, you got traded, correct? I got traded. I played with Kendall. Kendall and I were in the same grade. Um and but he went four years at Illinois, so right. I was two years ahead of him in the NBA. So we played together for one year and part of the next year, right? But Kendall always talks about, and I'm curious to get your opinion on this. If you would have been able to stay there, who is okay, first of all, who was part of that trade that included yeah. you? Well, uh, I was traded for Tommy Hammonds. Right. Um, but, but he talks about if you right, would have been right there. after. Yeah, I'd have been there with Dell Curry and Muggsy and and then Kendall Alonzo, and Larry, Larry, Larry Johnson. Johnson and he, he talks about it, mentions your name about that might have been, you know, because he talks about how he always regrets leaving yeah. Charlotte and going to Seattle because of how good that team really was. If they would yeah, if and, they could have just kept that team together. And he also mentions you because of uh he talked about how competitive that his rookie year was. I mean, he credits you with a lot of that because, you know, you were Rex Chapman and here comes Kendall Gill and he's a lottery pick. And uh, I love Kendall, man. He could really he play. He said you guys had some uh, pretty competitive practices. No question about it. And he, you could tell he was going to be a great, uh, just a great player. Uh, even, you know, the rookie year he's playing behind Dell and I. And, you know, we had just had experience on him, but I'm, I'm with Kendall in that regard. And I told Muggsy this not long ago, you know, I was traded three and a half years in and I wanted to act like I wanted this. I wanted, no, I did. It hurt. It hurt. You know, I know we were a bad team, but you could kind of, I hated not being able to be part of when it was going to be good because you could tell it was going to be good. Because you were the very first pick of the Charlotte Hornets, right? Yeah. Yeah, which was – yeah, that was a whole other weird thing. But uh, <laughs> I know we got to let get, let you go here in a, in a minute. I could talk and listen to this all day. Please come back on. I know Josh and I have a couple questions we want to ask uh, that we normally ask everybody. First, though, who's winning, the, who's winning it all, uh, Will, uh, in the NBA this year? Well, I made a statement when the playoffs first started that I thought that the team that comes out of the East will win it all, okay? Because mm. I'm looking at a healthy Milwaukee Bucks team, the hottest team in the NBA going into the playoffs, the Boston Celtics, a healthy Miami Heat team who you know is going to ramp mm -hmm. up the defensive intensity in the playoffs. But I just – the experience that Phoenix has, if they can stay healthy – the way that Aiton continues to play, and now that Booker's healthy, and talk about picking up guys on you yeah. know minimum contracts yeah. that are playing their ass off, that were kind of on the scrap heap of the NBA, kind of bouncing around the league and how these guys are paying dividends. A perfect example is even though he's not playing a lot, um, and I just drew a blank, but he just picking a guy up, Played Tory in Charlotte. Curry. No, the backup Tory. post. Um, JaVale? Ja not oh, JaVale. No, no but Bismack, Biombo. Bismack. Yeah. You pick Bismack up. Again, he was out of the league for a while because he talked yeah. about how he had to get his head straight. He had some personal things going on. And you see how well he played and carried him. And it just seems like it's one of those things you start thinking about the bigger picture and they're just pushing all the right buttons. Yeah. And they have the, they have the exact – 
perfect match for the head coach with the players that they have and Chris Paul. So I'm, I'm altering my initial prediction and I'm going with the Phoenix Suns. Mm. I loved it. I love to hear now, that. Rex, I, the one thing I wanted to know, and I apologize if you've been asked this question before. No, all good. But this is kind of a, a question for me mm-hmm. because I haven't – and it, I can honestly say that you and I, it seems like our paths kind of just – keep crossing Mm -hmm. yeah you know like every three four or five years whatever it may be you know why we played against each other you know in college and then we Mm play against each other in the nba and then we worked for tune in for a year out in in, uh california and but knowing what i know about you and the adversity that you faced you know it's one it's one thing to face the adversity that you faced the and I, I hope don't take this the wrong way, but just no, no, the embarrassment that you had to face because of some of the things that happened with you and how you've been able to not only dig yourself out of the hole, but now fill that hole in and, and build something on top of it, but yet. You know, I follow you on Twitter like everybody else. Like, you know, how many followers do you have now? Uh, it's over a million, I think, which yeah. is weird. <laughs> but still, the heat and the the hatred that you face because of the things that you've done, it's like people refuse to forgive you. I'm curious how – and this, this may take a second for you to answer, but yeah. – Part part of this is because I have a son that's 18 and graduating high school, but you had to face, you know, what was going on in your life. I've never seen a descriptive answer. I'm sure it's out there, mm-hmm. but I haven't necessarily read it or yeah. heard it specifically from you. But the adversity that you had to face, the fact that you had to basically look in the mirror and humble yourself and make and, and admit you know, what the problem was, Mm -hmm. overcome the problem, still deal with all the hatred, but yet still succeed at not only, you know, the Twitter, the, the podcast, the, you're on, you know, um, NBA TV, TNT. Right. But the biggest thing is, is you have your daughters. And I always like, as we get older, Mm -hmm. You know, because, you know, we're two guys now in our 50s, you know, and this is more about, you know, a learning aspect that I think everybody, regardless of who they are, can take. How did you continually get out of bed every morning and face that challenge? Because, you know, some people can say, well, he had an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. I pretty much say it was like he had to crawl straight up uh, vertically a drawbridge that was up. Yeah, well, you know what? That gosh, Will, thanks. Um, when well, you're looking at one of them, Josh, my buddy here. You know, when I got out of rehab and and was trying to build back, I'd I'd burned through a lot of resources. I'd burned through a lot of friendships. I'd learned relationships, or I'd been avoiding those relationships. Uh, but Josh was there from day one. I lived on Josh's couch for a couple of years out in L.A. while I was trying to get my body right, my head right. So was Josh who you were staying with when we did tune in? Yep. So mm. that was Josh's <laughs> El Camino. That, that's my El Camino. <laughs> but it, it was in front of Josh's even after I left Josh's for about a year. <laughs> yeah. I remember at, at tune in, we used to park in that little gated lot. You'd come pull it up right. in that El Camino. That old El Camino. I've still got it. I've still got it. But yeah, through friends and, and then, you know, like – like you said, with kids, everything that I, you know, I being a, in co- competition and being so basketball focused from the time I was not 13, but age five, you know, just obsessed with basketball. I had a lot of 
catching up to do, growing up to do, and learning to do. I needed to learn what I liked outside of what I even liked outside of basketball that wasn't self-destructive. So Mm -hmm. I had to go back and really kind of take all of that stuff and own what I did and, and my part in it. And then having friends that, that just are there uh, and just love you and want to see you, you know, healthy and thriving again. It's nothing you can do on your own. So just uh, through a lot of good friendships, I, I've, so I've been able to something kind else. Of, yeah. And I'm sorry to cut you off, but I think no, this is important too. It's that mentality of, what you faced at Kentucky, what you faced in the NBA that helped you get out from a toughness standpoint. But I'm curious with this answer, because I don't think people realize this when it comes to athletes because we're creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. Was that the same thing that helped you get out? Was that something that, that actually made things harder for you because we are creatures of habit because we're, we're, you know, people like ask me, you know, do you gamble? Do you do this? Mm-hmm. Do you do that? Like right. when I have injuries and mm-hmm. I have, you know, I have a minor surgery here or there or have something and they're like, oh, we're going to give you some pain pills. I'm like, oh, no, yeah. no. Why not? Yeah. I'm like, well, because I kind of have an addictive personality. That's kind of what right. got me to where I am. Do mm-hmm. you feel like that also was a hindrance? Yeah. As you were falling into this hole. It actually made things worse because mm-hmm. of those practices that we have developed that made us such good basketball players. Yeah, definitely. And and I think part of that too, is that, you know, people can even, once I started taking painkillers, you know, I had buddies that would be like, what are you doing? Like, you're going to kill yourself or you're going to, and, and that, you know, I'm one of one thick sort of mentality like <laughs> i i can do this i know other mm-hmm. people might struggle with that but not me I, have you seen what i've done on a basketball court that sort of you know just arrogant uh immature stupid sort of thinking um which you know in many ways helps as an athlete to have the, just this uh, unreasonable confidence in yourself so yeah for sure. It, it, it's something that, and then it helped dig me out of it for sure. Also. So I appreciate the question. Well, thanks. And I got one more and this is my last yeah. one. And I think this yeah. is for everybody because, you know, right now we're all questioning the direction our society is going. Um, you know, Elon Musk supposedly has bought Twitter to make it a better safe place, but we all know, you know, what's going on with social media right now. We all know about uh, hatred. We know about bullying. Yep. I mean, the fact that you've been able to turn yourself around and, and be a success story. What what advice would you give to people out there who are constantly inundated on social media? You know, they get on social media for yeah. one reason, but it's just a constant barrage of hate and criticism. And because I mean, you still face that to yeah. this day. How do you how do you get out of that rut? I think that the, I think that, and I've, I've only learned this or taken this philosophy in the last couple of years because it's taken some time. Twitter's not real. Twitter's not real. Just, we got to remember that it's, it's a thing. Yeah, I get it. But all the hatred that I've, that I take on social media or that you might take from a Bulls fan after whatever it is, or that Josh might take over a movie he was in that, you know, people hated or hated. People will say stuff on Twitter. Almost nobody ever in real life says something like that, Uh, you know, and, and it just tells you people can say whatever they want on Twitter and they do so because it's largely faceless and you probably, you might not know who's on the other end. That's why they're doing it. It's somewhere for them to go and vent. And look, I'm human too. They're, it's impossible to not see some of this stuff. Josh tells me, he said, I'll, Josh says, I can't go on your feed because, you know, I'll get mad and I'll start getting into it with somebody. So I think yeah, the, mo- I the, the, less, the lesson is Twitter's not real. It's not real life. And, um, you know, if that's, if those things are getting you down, 
then please log off and take a break. Right. I'm always, I'm always like, Oh, well, John sting dong for the why don't you shut your fucking hole and take your two <laughs> followers. And I'm like, back, 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 get off here. Get off here. <laughs> Oh, Will. Hey, Will, what's your favorite uh, favorite movie all time? Oh, man. Um, see, this is also a sign that I'm worried about. I, I forget things. Yeah, I but, do too. So what's, what's the movie where the guy gets uh, put in jail? Uh, Shawshank. Shawshank. Shawshank, yep, yep. That That's is, a popular one. That's, but and that's I know people are like, wait a minute, how can you not remember the name? I'm like, I constantly forget no, stuff. I, now. But <laughs> I'm just like, I remember the first time I saw Andrew Dufresne. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Dufresne. Uh huh. Uh-huh. That's right. Okay. Good. Uh, what about what about if you could sit down for dinner with anyone, dead or alive? Um, you know, the funny thing is. Yeah, I think that if you ask me that question every 10 years, the answer is probably different. Yeah, yeah. Sure, but now <laughs> – Probably now, every day. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll be 57 this year. This would be quite the dinner, but the three of us would be myself, Moses. Malone? He could rebound. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh. I know. <laughs> Moses from the Bible, but, yes, he could rebound okay. too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's not even. I would probably have to say um, Wilt Chamberlain. No. Oh, what okay. a day! What wow, a day! Because yeah. I'd be interested. Because I thought that I always thought that he was way before his time. Yeah. Oh, as yeah. an individual <laughs> and an athlete. <laughs> I can just see Moses like, hold on, hold on, before we go to the parting <laughs> duck, how many women? <laughs> How's that possible? <laughs> I'll tell you about the parting thing. <laughs> oh, let's rewind that. Yes. So let me ask you a question there, Will. <laughs> That's what I, t- I mean, it, it, it just, it would be an interesting dinner, but I just, when no I couldn't way. decide, because I just, I've yeah. always been fascinated by Wilt Chamberlain because of just, you know, the time in which he played, the time in history. And I would just love to sit there and pick his brain. You know, I know yeah. people might think that's kind of odd, but no. also, also as you get older, and I don't know if you guys do this or not, but, you know, and, and Rex, you, you, I'm sure you've had, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm going to be 57 and, all of a sudden you got people younger than you that are oh yeah yeah passing away because of cancer or a heart attack or something right yeah yeah and all of a sudden you just think about you start thinking about am i comfortable with who i am and the legacy that i've left behind that if i you know unfortunately god forbid pass away tomorrow yeah you know and then in the afterlife, am I going to look down and be like, man, I'm just, I left so much, so much work to do. Yep. You know, yep. And, and that's why, you know, we'll go full circle. And, and that's why I always, you know, when you asked me to come on the podcast, I was like, you know, I wanted to ask you those questions because, yeah. you know, my wife, I, I didn't, my life, I don't want people to take this the wrong way. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I've been very fortunate to experience a lot and I, I was going to use the word uneventful, but then people are like, man, are you crazy? And think about all these great things you've done and had the opportunity to do mm-hmm. well, 99% of that, all that stuff is because of basketball, but I know this is in this has this has something to do with the mentality that you develop as a basketball player as a competitive person, as an athlete, as a, you know, that's kind of like, you're kind of on the edge of, mm-hmm. you know, like people use the term on, man, you're sick, something wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that's also what gives you that, that advantage. But I always think about, 
you know, and it, it's it's hard to to try to say this without being demeaning, but somebody like yourself, because we all know so many people that have been in similar situations to yourself that just unfortunately didn't make it or they've yeah. never been successful or, you know, I just like, I know it's TV, but I'm, I'm my wife and I were, you know, we're watching the last seven episodes of Ozark. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, there's the one scene we just watched one of the episodes uh, Tuesday night where Ruth is sitting on the couch and she's talking to her friend that she went to Florida to get and brought back and said, you know what? <laughs> and her friend's just like, Ruth, you deserve this. People like you and I, we don't get these opportunities. We're always the people in trouble. We're always the people in jail. We're always fighting an uphill battle. And I always, you know, you love stories like that, but you also really look at those people. And I, I think you're a shining example wow. of people that had faced life-threatening situations and not because you've had cancer or anything yeah. of that nature, or as far as I know, haven't had a heart attack, but right. I mean, it's just, and you occasionally will do something on Twitter or social media regarding, you mm. know, the Purdue thing and, you know, right. oxycodone and all this stuff. And I, you know, we, I think about what you, I mean, you were, I mean, you were an individual that was in the fight for your life. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I always think about overcoming stuff like that and how proud, and this is more of an individualistic thing, but I, and I hope you are, but how proud you must be of yourself when you wake up every morning, because it's not, the fight's not over. It's, you have to You're face right. that still every day now. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's not, but I, I feel more grateful uh, and really every day that goes by, I don't think there's a time a day a time that I don't, that I'm not grateful that I don't have to go, that I, I, I'm where I'm grateful that I don't have to go to the pharmacy or to a drug dealer or to, it took up so much time and effort and uh, just stress. Um, that part of it, I'm just so grateful for it to, because for years, 15, 14, 15 years, I just had resigned myself. That's this is my lot in life and this is how it's going to be. I tried getting off before I couldn't get off and I just thought I'd always be on forever. So I'm just grateful, still just grateful to be here. I, I and, think, but I, that's why when you asked me to come on this, I was like, that was kind of like, thanks, a, buddy. quite honestly, it was, it's, for me, it was kind of like a badge of honor. I was like, all right, oh, I'm on man, I appreciate it. I I got, it wasn't, wasn't so much for the on. athletic as, aspect, but it was a, I mean, it was selfish in nature because of, all right, I'm going to be able to ask oh, him a couple stop. questions. Stop, no, I'm buddy. serious I'm, about. I'm glad. You and did. I know some people will be like, "Hey, man, you're you're really making way too much of this." And I'm like, "No, I don't think uh -huh. I am." Because I, my wife and I were watching a Suns game earlier in the year, not a playoff game, but there was a game earlier in the year where you took both your daughters to the Suns game. Yeah, and you were sitting on the floor. Yep. And you know the camera goes on you every once in a while. And I just remember, you know, looking at that and I looked at my wife and I feel very fortunate. I mean, I've faced some adversity and gone mm -hmm. through divorce and all that stuff, you yep. know, but yep. I just remember looking at my wife and I said, you know, it's, it kind of, it, it means a lot to me to see a guy like Rex Chapman, who's been through a lot that I will unfortunately say that I made some bad judgments, possibly look down my nose at because of mm -hmm. things that happened. Right. But yet it was how rewarding it was because just the fact that you were actually able to go to the game with your daughters and enjoy yourself. Yeah. And that's one of the simple pleasures in life. And that's kind of one of those things you see that and it's, it kind of reminds you. And I told my wife, I said, we need to do more stuff like that just to, you know, we don't have to go on all these fancy trips yeah. and all that stuff. And, you know, I mean, I kid you not, from that point on, my wife and I started when I wasn't doing games and the Bulls had a home game, my wife and I would go to the Bulls games and That's just great. sit and enjoy the game and do stuff like that. That's great. And I, I, I think I, Josh you know, had said the same thing. I appreciate you saying that, Will, because I think that same night, Josh probably remembers. I, and it was my youngest daughter. And she and I hadn't mm -hmm. really been been anywhere together in a few years. 
So that you stopped and noticed that, well, just, just means the world, buddy. I appreciate it. Well, I just think about, you know, it's kind of funny. There's certain people in your life, like I talked about, where our paths have kind of consistently yeah. crisscrossed and, you know, we are, you know, we would see each other at games or whatever. Yeah. So we were always cordial, but it's just, you know, it's, it's one of those things. That. It's just, it's a reminder of how easily you can fall off the tracks. Yeah. That's the but, scariest part is the, is yeah. that, that is the scariest part for me. Cause I, you know, there'll be times I'm walking through life and I think ah, I got life, you know, everything's good and all that. Once you've fallen off the tracks, like however you want to classify that, but gotten, you know, arrested and, and rehabbed and all that. Once you've gone off the tracks, there's a constant fear, a constant fear that uh, how, however big or small that mm. you, you can possibly do that again. If you let yourself. Oh yeah. Easily. And but that's, I just, that's I just, terrifying. Probably a very people, healthy fear. Right. Right. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. But I just hope but, that uh, people, whether they like you or not, because we're in a, we're in a time now in our society where, you know, a lot of people are focusing on the negative where people yeah. look at and they can look at Rex Chapman as, Hey, if he can do it, I can do it. Oh, mm-hmm. You know, and I know it's, so. it's simplistic, but dude, you, you put in a lot of hard work to get back. Thanks, buddy. It's taking a lot I, of I mean, friends. I, I don't know if, what's the, Hey, so Josh, what do you think's the best word to, to kind of close on? Because I want to say respectability, but I think that that's kind of like that's that's not a, a, a strong enough word for for Rex for yeah for where what? he's how he's been able to turn himself around. Uh, you know resiliency, um, and then cliche as as it could be, you know love. You yeah. know his girls, his his son Zeke. He, he if he didn't have them, I don't think he'd be. Here. And, oh, well and, put. and he did <laughs> he you know that that took that kind of love and yeah. and he he uh Rex has a lot of self hate in a lot of ways and he wouldn't have done it for himself, I don't believe. I think he did it for his kids. That's pretty true. All right, Will. Hey buddy, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Uh we gotta do it again. I, I do want to talk some more basketball because I told Josh before we came on. You're like a an encyclopedia. You don't just show up at games and and not know what you're talking about. You do it just like a a, a bandy guy would. So I try, man. <laughs> but I appreciate Will, it. And I thank, thank you, you for putting up with me, allowing me to ask questions. Josh, it was great to meet you. Pleasure. I mean, like I said, this this was awesome, man. I I thank you very much. I mean, when uh, Jeremiah reached out to me, I mean, that's one of the things I was like, all right, how do I get this? How do I make this happen? How soon can we do it? Awesome. And uh, it's really been enjoyable. I told my wife how much I was looking forward to it. So thank Fantastic. you. Tell him hot. Thank you, hot man. Us. Thanks, Will. All right, man. Josh, what'd you think of wow. Big Will? That was fun. I mean, I just remember him playing at Rep, Ar- Rep Arena all those times. Oddly, I remembered them saying, and he's got size 20 shoes. Right? Yeah, we didn't even right? we didn't even get into that somehow. Yeah. But yeah, Will has like a I wish we should have. He's got like a size 20, but it's like a double narrow. It's something really strange. Like, yeah, really? Yeah. He's got some yeah. skis on, Skitty, huh? Skinny, skinny feet. <laughs> what? Well, I also liked it when he said, I hadn't thought of Jefferson Pilot and string music. String music. String the, music. The thing when anybody uh, reminds, uh, reminds me of Jefferson Pilot, the thing that comes to mind was when I was a sophomore, freshman or sophomore at Kentucky, this announcer, this new announcer that was coming to Jefferson Pilot was going to interview me, fly to, I think it was Starkville or or, uh, Oxford, somewhere in Mississippi, and going to do a halftime show on me. And I got there and that new new reporter was a guy named Pete Maravich. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I was like, what is going on? And Pete oh, Maravich uh, uh, inter- interviewed me. And then uh, it wasn't a year later, maybe he died. 
And I was like, Mm -hmm. whoa, what is that? Anyway, but yeah, Jefferson Pilot. All right, Josh, that's episode uh, 41. Let's, uh, how about meet back here next week for another one? Let's do this. Let's do it. Thank you, everyone, for watching The Rex Chapman Show with Super Josh Hopkins. Come back next week right here, powered by BasketballNews.com.